I'm a worshiper. That's the best thing you can put on your resume. The best thing you can put on your resume is I worship the true and living God who's coming back for me real soon. Thank you, Jesus. And if I die before my Messiah returns, I want it written on my tombstone. Here lies a worshiper. No, I'm not talking about his physical feet. I'm talking about bowing down to your king. Don't wait until Lazarus is dead for you to invite him in. As Jesus walked the dusty roads of Africa, and if you check, his feet never left Africa. Jesus, being God, gets to experience what it's like to be tired, to be fatigued and to have sore feet. Jesus didn't have a Tesla Model 3. He walked from city to city. He walked for days ministering to us. The Bible says he's done so many things in the less than four years of his ministry that it's impossible to record it all. That's why we worship him, because he's faithful and he's so giving. He deserves worship. Listen carefully. If God forces you to worship him, it's not the same as worship from someone that truly believes he's worthy. Is he worthy? Does your God deserve worship? Can he have your worship? Talk back to me now. Is, is worshiping God too much to ask? Yes or no? Matthew 19, 27, then answered Peter and said to the Lord, this is Peter. We all know Peter. We all know how Peter works. We all know how he operates. He said, look, we gave up everything and followed you. What shall we have because of that? You ungrateful, loud mouth, big head. You act like it's some even trade following God. Who's more valuable, your friends or Jesus? Who, who told you that you need to get something from following God? Is it a more precious thing to be able to hang with your family or have God's attention? Hey, Peter, you gave up your hard working job, right? Only to be completely sustained by the Lord. Did you read anywhere where the apostles were ever sick or hungry? You get to be in the presence of God daily and you asking what you're going to get. Can you? ever stop and look at what you already got for some reason jesus didn't just respond the way i would have responded i would have said you get to see me work miracles firsthand you get my favor maybe jesus knew that the apostle was about to go through some stuff he, he knew y'all about to get beat y'all about to go to jail y'all about to get murdered so maybe that's why he didn't respond harshly the lord today in his infinite wisdom this is why we serve god because he has infinite wisdom his wisdom never ends Today, he wants you not to focus on your current life. Your current life is temporary. Your regenerated life is eternal. God said, if you have forsaken houses or brothers or sisters, if you had to distance yourself from your parents or your wife or your children or property for my name's sake, if you did it for the Lord, the Bible says, Jesus says, you shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit an everlasting life. Who doesn't want an everlasting life? That's why you need to get busy working in the ministry. You need to start shedding sin from your life. It's okay if you have to turn your back on people. It's okay if you're ostracized because God is going to pay you 100-fold. What kind of mind do you need? to be able to think everlasting life is a bad thing? How can you consider permanent peace, constant healing, unexplainable joy? I'm sorry, how is that a bad thing? How is that not an attainable goal in your life? How is that not something that you want, something you're striving for? Eternal life, forever peace? Have you considered the alternative? What is the alternative to hanging with God forever? Hang out with God all day sounds boring? Do you know who the alternative to hanging out with God in eternity is? Matthew 24, 6 says, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. And yes, that includes race wars. Jesus said, make sure that you don't get anxiety. Make sure you don't freak out because all these things must come to pass. These things are going to happen, but the end is not yet. Why are people so focused on today and yesterday and not the day that the Lord is going to return? 
That's the only day that's guaranteed. That's the only day you should be focused on. That's the only day you should be worried about. The sun may not shine tomorrow, but the Lord will come back. You may not live to see next month, but it's guaranteed that the Lord is coming back. Look at the news, not entertainment news, okay? World news, not world star. Look at what's happening in Africa. Look at all the major changes in monetary funds coming up. Look at the power moves and alliances that Putin is making. Look at the inevitable food shortage. There are trucking companies that's gone out of business. Do you really think the last pandemic was the last pandemic? I promise you, World War III is coming. Matthew 24, 7 says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence. That means diseases and, 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 uh, and earthquakes in various places. Do you know why I'm content with today? It's because I know who holds tomorrow. That's why I'm not worried about today. The Bible says don't let your heart be troubled because God is in control. I have an anchor in the Lord. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. I know God is in control of tomorrow. Thank you, Jesus. While calamity is present, when the missile starts flying, I'll be worshiping because my king is coming. I've already forsaken everything for the Lord. And God keeps his promises. He said he'll keep me in perfect peace if my mind is stayed on him. He said he'll give me everlasting life if I listen to him. All I got to do is what the Bible says. All I got to do is what he says. God in heaven, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, help me to obey your word, please, God. Help me not to miss opportunities to worship you, God. Help me, God, not to complain about the now because tomorrow will make today irrelevant. Jesus, who, by the way, kept all the feast days. Did you know that? We see the Lord here preparing his last Passover before he dies. He's enjoying his Passover dinner with his closest church members. While he's eating his food, he told Judas, get out of my face, dude. They were singing some songs. You know, Jesus, he's hanging out with his homies. He's doing his thing. In John 13, 5, he says, after he's done eating his, his jerk lamb and, and rice and peas and dumpling, Jesus pours water into a basin. They're watching him as he begins to wash the disciples' feet. And they wiped them with the towel that he had wrapped around his waist. So after he had washed their feet, he grabbed his towel and his stuff and he went and sat back down. Then he asked him, do y'all know what I just did? Do you know what I just did to you? What's the correlation in the Bible with feet, water, and wine? We keep seeing these elements together. They're having their yearly required. This is a requirement. They're yearly required Passover feast. They're eating some tender lamb. They're drinking some wine. And out of nowhere, he begins to start washing their feet. He never did that before. He didn't do that last Passover. God can't be washing people nasty, dirty feet. Isn't that a job for a servant? You remember when God turned water into wine? Y'all remember that? Talk back to him. Where did he get the water from? You know how we have a shoe rack at the front door? Most people have shoe racks at the front door of their house. Back then, we had water pots so you could wash the dust off your feet before tracking all that stuff in your house. So Jesus and his mother, they're at this wedding, and uh, they had some great big water pots, the, the rain catcher type, the, the big 20-gallon ones. And Jesus' mother convinced him to perform his first miracle ever. Once again, we got feet, water, and wine. There was a woman. You remember the woman who stood behind Jesus? She stood behind the Lord's feet. She stood behind him weeping. Why is this woman crying? Has anybody thought about that? Why is this woman washing the Lord's feet with her tears and wiping them with the hairs of her head and kissing, kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment? She didn't have any water, so she used tears. Jesus washed the disciples' feet None of them, not one of them washed his. This woman, she's the one that washed Jesus' feet. Hey, Peter, Thomas, John, all y'all, you missed a very big opportunity. You missed a huge opportunity, but this woman didn't. They never said this woman's name. They just labeled her a sinner. What is she crying for? Maybe she knew nobody would wash his feet. What do you think? 
Maybe she's sad because she knows in a few days he'll be murdered. Maybe she don't want to be a sinner no more. Maybe she's a worshiper. How can you not care that people are looking at you? You've humbled yourself. All of us need to begin to humble ourselves. All of us need to begin to humble ourselves and worship our God. If the Lord walked in here right now in the flesh, if he walked in here right now in the flesh, if the Lord walked into your house or wherever you're watching this right now, would you worship him? Would you not want to be a sinner anymore? Would you care if there's people looking at you in the next 48 hours talking to you all? How much worship will God get from you? In the next 48 hours, how much worship will permeate out of the roof of wherever you live? In the next 48 hours, that being that your soul is inside of, how much worship will come out of there? How much worship will come out of that orifice in your face? How much worship will come out of your mind and out of your soul in the next 48 hours, the next 24 hours? While Jesus was there hanging out, he's eating food. No doubt they offered him the best wine. Jesus came to your house. You got to get the best uh, dishes out, right? You got to get everything ready. The Lord is here. While he's there and they're giving him the best food, they missed the most important part. But a worshiper showed up. She washed, she kissed, and she anointed her savior. Don't focus on the wrong thing. Because worship is the most important thing you could ever do. In Luke 7, 44, the Bible says, and he turned to the woman and said unto Simon. Did you catch that? He's talking to Simon, but he can't take his eyes off the worshiper. Did you see that? It says, and he turned to the woman and said unto Simon. He's rebuking Simon, but this worshiper has his attention. Did you catch that? Did you see what's going on here? He's multitasking, but his main focus is on the person that decides to worship him. He told Simon, hey, Simon, you see this woman? That's when he told Simon exactly what he, what he, what he could have done and exactly what he didn't do. And he praised a true worshiper. He said, you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. I appreciate the food, Simon, but why didn't you worship me? Peter wanted to know what's in it for me. See, Peter looking for carnal stuff, tangible stuff. This woman looking for nothing. The only thing she's looking for is to bless her God. And look what she got. God told her in verse 48, your sins are forgiven. How badly do I want God to say my sins are forgiven? Can you imagine hearing God say your sins are forgiven? I will do anything. I will give up everything. I want God to say my sins are forgiven. Do you want God to tell you that your sins are forgiven? Money can't buy me that. Education can't get me that. But worship. Y'all called her a sinner when she walked in here. What you gonna call her when she walk out? She came in burdened with sin. Couldn't figure her life out, but something happened. Something changed. She didn't determine that she was saved. She didn't join some religion and convince herself she's all right now. She got the master to say, I got you. Everything's going to be all right. Yeah. Can you imagine if God says that in your ears? Don't you know today you can get the God of the universe to forgive you? You can get him to let you slide. You can make the decision right now and God. God can let you get away with every single solitary thing you've ever done. Who wouldn't serve a God like that? What would it take for you to cry out to God right now and not worry about what people are going to say? You're probably home by yourself. You're probably home with just your family. What would it take for you to cry out to God? What would it take for you to worship God? What would it take for you to give God all you got? What would it take for you to give him something? What would it take for you to realize this current world system is over? You got a few days before the Lord cracks the sky. In a few days, the Lord is going to crack the sky and he's going to say, come, my people. You know, I believe when people get the Holy Ghost, when the Lord fills you with the Holy Ghost, I believe when he shows up and takes permanent residence in your body, I believe when you speak in tongues for the first time, that's when he announces, I'm here and you've been forgiven. If I ever get a chance to be in the presence of God, I'm going to be grateful because everybody ain't going to get that chance. Within your being, within your body, within your flesh, you were born 
with the desire to worship. Did you know that's that? Did anybody know that? Worship is natural. It's natural for you. It's natural for us. But the cares of this world, listen carefully, the cares of this world and the desire for entertainment, that those desires suppress your soul's ability to express adoration for the creator. Don't ever miss another opportunity to worship your God. Somebody say, I'll worship you. Somebody say, it. somebody type in the chat. I'll worship you, Lord. Let that be your declaration today. Just type in the chat. I will worship you, God. I want to make a decision just because you're worthy, just because you deserve it, just because you're awesome, just because you're magnificent, just because you're powerful, just because you're mighty. I'm going to worship you, Lord. That's what I'm going to do. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. I remember that. And the disciple says, Master, hold up, wait. They've been looking for you in that city. They've been looking to stone you. You going there again? And that's what Thomas said. Thomas, y'all remember Thomas? Old Dalton Thomas? He said, let us all go with them so, that they may, so we can die with him. When they stone our master, when they stone our king, when they stone our savior, let us all go. So we all can die with him. Talk about forsaking everything. What about your life? Are you ready to surrender your life for the life that the Lord has for you? Can God depend on you to have his back? Like these disciples, like Thomas. Thomas was ready to go die for him or die with him. When we pray, we got a whole list of stuff. We got a whole list of requests, right? Which one of your needs do you deserve? Which ones should God answer? What do you do for him? Does your God have needs? Is there anything your God wants? Jesus shows up late. And it's here that Martha tells Jesus, Jesus, my, my brother, he wouldn't have died if you would have been here two days ago. Yesterday was too late. Today is impossible. Martha. Martha, Martha, Martha. Do you know who is in control of today? Do you realize who you're talking to? How how do you how can how can you know the Lord is on the way and you not be at ease? How can you know the Lord heard you and you still worrying? How can you ever be defeated if you have a connection with the Almighty God? I'll give up everything for that connection. Thank you, Jesus. It is here, right here, right now, that Thomas convinced the apostles. Come on, let's go with him so we can all die with him. So the apostles come with him so that they can all die with him. They want, of course, they wanted to see Lazarus. They remember Lazarus. They hung out with him. They remember Lazarus, but they really wanted to just go with God to be there for him. And Martha said, Lord, I want, to, I want to rehearse this in your hearing. Martha said, Lord, if you would have been here, here where? She trusts God, but one little bit. She knows he can heal the sick, but that raising the dead stuff, can't get with that. I know God can heal other folk. I know God can save people, just not me. I got too much baggage. I got too much stuff going on. I got too many things to give up. I I, I know God is awesome. I know he's, he's powerful, but I can't believe him for hard things. I, the life God got for me can't be better than the current life I'm living. So I don't want to make any changes to see God move in my life. She said, if, if you would have been here, why would he be there? Why would God dwell with you? You want God to be a victim of your secondhand smoke? You want him to see you dressed like that? You want God to have to cover his ears because you got a potty mouth? Why would God dwell with you? Why would God come to your house? Why would God come to your abode? Why would God hang out with you? Thank you, Jesus. Martha said, if he would have been here, where? With you? Do you even have any music that doesn't that that's not talking about fornication? Could you invite the Lord into your lifestyle? That's what I'm asking. you. No, not now. Because right now things are going okay. My life is great. Right now I'm feeling well and I have all I have the activity of all my limbs. Everything is working. So so right not right now. I don't need God now. I don't need to worship God. I don't need to wash nobody's feet. Why is worship so uncomfortable? How does one person desperately want Jesus? How does one person desperately want to be with God and another person want him to stay away? Which one are you? 
Are you the one that says, I'm not ready for God, not ready for salvation, not ready to do what he says? Or are you the one that says, come, Lord Jesus, grace of our Lord, Savior Jesus Christ, be with me, Lord. Are you the one with sickness that the doctor can't heal? Are you the one on the brink of losing your mind? Are you like this woman? Are you like the, with this woman who has a dying family member, frantically trying to find somebody? Go get the Lord. Go, go get a word to him. Somebody find him. Go to every city and tell God I need him. You need him. But if he comes to your city, they're going to stone him. Do you still selfishly want him to come? You want God to risk his life to come help you? Who are you? What have you done for him? Will you wash his feet when he comes? What is he coming for? This ain't the only person on earth that needs God. You ain't the only person that needs help. You ain't the only person that's praying. When you call on God, when you really need him, there's somebody else that needs him too. Probably with a little more, with a dire situation, a, a more worse situation than you. You sick, but somebody dying. Your back hurt, and somebody's child didn't come home from school. Your supervisor getting on your nerves. While somebody's begging God not to let him get evicted. Why should God listen to you? What have you done for him? There's somebody at the morgue right now. And they're about to identify the body of, of somebody they love. When they pull the sheet back. They hope it's not their, their, their loved one. But at the same time they want the closure. If it's not their loved one, well, where is he? And they're desperately calling on God before they walk in their room. And you want God to come to you instead based on what? Yeah, God can answer multiple prayers at, at the same time. But why would he answer you? That's the question I have for you. What if you've already put your time in? What if God remembers when you washed his feet? How did these apostles miss the chance to wash Jesus' feet? That's a big honor. That's a humbling experience. Jesus washed their feet and they did nothing. I want to be humble enough to bow before my God. I want to be humble enough to get on my knees. I have a determination to give to my God and not just take from him. I want to pour into him. Does anybody feel my spirit when I'm saying that I want to give something to him? I'm asking God to accept something from me. We always asking God for something. What do we ever offer him? What can you give the God of the universe? God almighty that retains judgment in his possession. See, I like Thomas. Y'all mad at him because he couldn't accept that the man he saw murdered is alive. So y'all mad at him. See, Thomas was the one that was ready to die with the Lord. It was his plan to go. So when he saw the Romans kill this unarmed man, he went straight into depression. He went into depression because he gave up everything. When he saw the Romans kill him, he didn't know what to do. I gave up everything, but for what? For what though? What do I have now? What am I supposed to do now? I gave up that girl I was living with and not married to. I stopped clubbing. I stopped getting lit on weekends and my God is dead. I stopped hanging around my friends that didn't want to live right. My family stopped taking my calls and I was willing to die with him. It was my idea. When Jesus appeared to the disciples in that room, it was only 10 of them. Judas dead, time is gone. But I get it. Thomas sold out, but he didn't see tomorrow. He didn't understand yesterday's situation could be irrelevant tomorrow. What you're going through today can easily change tomorrow. So don't give up today. So Thomas said, y'all keep texting me and, and, and telling me you saw the Lord raised from the dead. I'm just going to continue to leave y'all on red. If you keep blowing me up about seeing Jesus, I'm going to keep ignoring y'all. If y'all want to continue to be the follower of a dead man, go ahead. Because when I see the nail prints in his hand, and until I push my finger in the hole in his side, that's what I believe. How come? He, he Notice he said something about the nail prints in his hand. He also said something about the hole in his side. How come he didn't say nothing about the holes in his feet? Just a few days ago, Thomas, he was ready to die with the Lord. That's good. Remember when he washed your feet, Thomas? Did you wash his? I want to remind you, when the Lord washed their feet, 
Not one of them washed his feet. You know why? Because if God forces you to worship him, it ain't real worship. If he tells you to worship him, you don't really think he's worthy of the worship, do you? Do you know who the woman was that washed Jesus' feet? It was Mary that washed his feet. This same Mary is Lazarus' brother. It was the same Mary that the Lord came to raise her brother from the dead. Lazarus' sister was the one that washed Jesus' feet. What if she didn't worship him first? It was her worship that made Jesus even say, listen, even though they want to stone me, I'm going to the beckoning call of a worshiper. This ain't no ordinary person that needs me. And I will never, ever forget those people that worship me. How can God forget the one person? The one person on earth that washed and kissed his feet. Oh my God, this person that washed his feet, this person that used her hair to dry his feet, God is not going to forget that person. God's not going to forget the worshiper. God's not going to ignore you if you need him, but you've been a worshiper before. God says, oh, your brother died? Oh, you need me? I'm coming. But Lord, Lord, hold up, hold up. They're going to stone you. God says, I'll make a way out of no way. But God, hold on, hold on, hold on, God. You're going back to that city. But by the time you get there, Lord, Lazarus is going to be dead. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I come to tell everybody tonight, God cannot resist a worshiper. That's what you should be doing. That's what your goal should be, to become a worshiper. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says, thank you, Jesus. This is uh, John 4, 23. The Bible says, but the hour is coming. And now that hour is. When the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Watch this. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Do you hear that? God Almighty who knows all things. The omniscient God of the universe. He is looking for something. Everything is before him. He can see everything. But God is looking for something. What is that something he's looking for? He's looking for you. He's looking for you to worship him. He's looking for you to adore him. He's looking for you to bow down. He's looking for you to, to humble yourself and wash his feet. I'm not talking about feet. I'm talking about worshiping him. I'm talking about bowing down and surrendering to him. I'm talking about giving God all you got. What will it take for you to worship God? Will it take calamity or will it take adoration? Hey, Lazarus, you better be glad you hung out with a worshiper. Because while you're dead, that worship that she gave God is working for you right now. Thank you, Jesus. You better be glad your sister was a worshiper. You all had better become a worshiper. Everybody under the sound of my voice, you better become a worshiper. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know when you're going to need the, need the Lord. Worship him. He'll show up. Worship him. He'll remember. Worship him today. He'll be there for you tomorrow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to become a worshiper. God wants you to become a worshiper. That's the best thing you can put on your resume. The best thing you can put on your resume is I worship the true and living God who's coming back for me real soon. Thank you, Jesus. And if I die before my Messiah returns, I want it written on my tombstone. Here lies a worshiper. No, I'm not talking about his physical feet. I'm talking about bowing down to your king. Don't wait until Lazarus is dead for you to invite him in. Mary, the other Mary, Jesus' mother. This Mary opened the door to the master's ministry. She didn't know how he was going to fix the problem they had. But she knows this dude, my son, he don't operate the way I expect him to. But if you want to see a miracle, all you have to do is do what he say. If you do what he say, you'll see a miracle. If you obey your problem will go away. Mary said, whatever he says, do it. Whatever is written in the Bible, do it. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How do you start to become a worshiper? Obey. You do what he say. That's your word for tonight. That's the solution to the problem you've been praying about. Whatever the Bible says, do it. Then worship him. Feet, water, wine. I'll bow down at his feet. I'll get baptized in water. And the wine is the new covenant in his blood. That's what we need. I need the blood. I need the blood of Jesus. 
I plead the blood of Jesus. Do you know what it means when you plead the blood of Jesus? You're pleading the blood, you're begging for his forgiveness. How are you going to worship God with unconfessed sin? In this final hour, before the Lord returns, I want you to become a worshiper. I want you to surrender your life to God and not be uncomfortable worshiping God. If you're uncomfortable, if you're shame, how about worshiping God when you're home alone? Is it so hard to just bow your head before him and say, Lord, I need you? God, you're greater than my problems. You're greater than me. Is it so hard to be a worshiper? Come on, y'all. Let's give God some praise. Let's give God some glory before the Lord comes back, before he comes back and before calamity hits, become a worshiper first. Be a worshiper first. Thank you, Jesus.